Um, I, I've taught for 20 years at a school in Quinton called Board Wellings Academy. Um, and we've had quite a, an interesting uh, history from the time that I've been there, which I'll, I'll you know, talk about a little bit more if people want to ask and so on and so forth. So that's my day-to-day -day job. Um, but however, I've done, I've still tried as much as possible to maintain um, quite a healthy uh, extracurricular existence outside of my schoolwork. Um, and as a, as, a, as a teaching practitioner, I do have a belief that I think if you work in, work in arts education, certainly as a teacher, it's, I think it's important that if you're a music teacher, an art teacher, a drama teacher, or whatever, that you still maintain some level of practice and maintain the thing that you kind of love if you can in some way or form. So um, I've been a member of the, the Crescent Theatre, uh, which is a non professional theatre company, but tend to do incredibly good things and lots of quality work. And I've been there since I was a kid, and then I rejoined as an adult theatre member when I left university. So I've been there about 20 years, and but then as well, um, in the last say seven or eight years, uh, the last 15 or 20 years, I've also been involved in music. In the last seven or eight years, I've been in a band called the Atlantic Players, and we tend to play quite a lot around around Birmingham, and uh, we, you know, perform in London and all kinds of things. So uh, that's kind of me really. That's I suppose why I'm here. I'm kind of arguably multi-skilled. Mm -hmm. If you do want to watch you singing, there is a link to one of the music videos on here. I watched it earlier and it is very good. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And then James, if you want yeah, to so, Hi everyone. Uh, I'm James. I work at Icon Gallery, which is um, an international contemporary art gallery uh, outside of Birmingham. Have you been, been there? Yeah, lots of, oh, everybody's been there. <laughs> Usually when I ask a group that, everybody's like, no, contemporary art, what? Um, yeah, so I've worked there for three years now. Um, one interesting thing that we can get into a bit more is the fact that I did what is effectively a graduate training scheme there, which is um, which is a paid role, more or less full time, um, which is a position called an information assistant, which who are in other words the people who sit in the gallery but don't get to see in the gallery. I'll make it sound so inaccurate. But the idea is that you're there to effectively be part of the interpretation and it's a methodology in itself. Um, so I did that and then rather than becoming a teacher, I almost became I went into gallery education and I've been doing that for two years. Um, so that's kind of the bridge version of my life up till now. I studied film for five years at Wolverhampton. Um, I did my undergrad and my master's there and, um, and had my first experience teaching there while I was doing my master's. So I was teaching second year undergrad, undergraduates. Um, yeah, and that's kind of it really. I mean, I was saying just before he came in that. Um, I had a bit of a different route. I didn't go straight into an undergraduate degree at the age of 18. I got a job uh, for a few years, which was pretty soul crushing. Um, and at the age of 23, I started my undergrad and then studied for five years. And then straight after I finished my master's, I, I got my first professional job at the age of 28. And now I'm in my early 30s and thinking about quitting because it's hard work. <laughs> No, um, but yeah, I mean, I'm happy to talk more about all sorts of opportunities at Icon and just in the arts generally. Um, but the first point might be the fact that, unlike many of my colleagues at Icon, um, I didn't study art history, I didn't study fine art, but I don't have any practice as such. It's interesting that you just mentioned mm. um, Yes, yeah, so I'm kind of almost like the old one out in a way. But you, but still, you still go and watch film, I suppose, don't you? So you're still kind of yeah, engaging sure. with... Yeah, and I'm writing. Yeah, I'm writing through, like through art like that right. instead of... Instead of film, so I suppose in a sense you might think about that as practice, um, but yeah, it's slightly different. Yeah, we'll change the band. Absolutely. Shall I just draw back out and let you teach out? That sounds like a good idea. Um, what I'm going to do before I go through a list of questions is anyone got any questions for you or James that they would like to ask? Any questions? No. Yeah. I have a question. Come on, man. We just did that game. <laughs> Um, this is actually more towards director uh, James about so you work within an organisation that isn't doesn't have an educational focus as the organisation you know you don't necessarily go to the gallery and expect to be taught something even though I know that obviously you are and then the work how important is it for an organisation like Icon to have a specific learning and participation and educational department. 
very because we're an educational charity, <coughs> and so the the way that we are funded, which is primarily through central government, we're a national portfolio organisation, so mm -hmm. like the Ref and, and like the Hippodrome. Um, so we we basically get money from central government to have an educational purpose in society. That's the point. Um, but I suppose you might see Icon or any contemporary gallery, or maybe any gallery or museum generally, as being more about displaying visual art mm -hmm. or whatever it is, um, rather than having directly an educational role. But we do, and I mean, education has been at the forefront of Icon going back to really the 1970s, and that's for a number of reasons, probably because the Arts Council became interested in galleries having an educational mm -hmm. role, which is probably because of what was happening in uh, formal education at that time, and is still and happening still now. Happening. And still um, yeah. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Me on to my question, which is why is art education so crucial? Are you asking me first? A <laughs> either of you. What was that? Oh, you oh, oh great. So go and then that's, the, that's great. Well, then then go something on nice and easy. That's great. Um, <laughs> I was thinking about an answer to this, and I, for myself, I always think to myself, I can never, in terms of like the impact of art in, a, in, its, in as broad a way as possible. And I constantly think about the fact that I could, I personally could never be that arrogant enough to think that, how can anybody be that arrogant enough to not think about the impact that art can have on the psyche, on the mind, on the physiology, on every single aspect of a person's life, you know, that some of maybe the greatest breakthroughs that have ever been made, for all we know, could have been a piece of music that somebody was listening to, put them in the right frame of mind for them to actually find a cure or make a breakthrough in some way or form. And, you know, we, we talk about the fact of, you know, that art is just so vitally important. It's the lifeblood. It is the, it is the reason that we pretty much exist, it, it, you know, in, in, in essence. And that's why, for me, I think it's so important that um, to, to kind of, like, continue to try and do that within my own work and do it outside of... My work, like coming to, to, to you know, evenings like, like, like today, really, to come and talk to people about it. Um, so that's that's why I think it's important because I just think you don't you don't know. Do you, do you understand where I'm coming from? Do you see where I'm coming from? You lots of heads looking at me. <laughs> do you see where I'm coming from? I think I think you just don't know what the impact the impact that it can have on a person's life and how it can change them and how it can help them move forward and how it can evolve, you know, and um, hey, whenever somebody's having a bad day, the thing they look for is often some kind of artistic release, whether it's listening to a piece of music because your boyfriend or girlfriend's broken up with you to keep you through it, to, you know, listening to your favourite radio station on the way home as you're driving home from work in, in the traffic in the pouring rain, you know what I mean, it's, it's so, if you take it in its broadest sense, I just think it's, it's the foundation for everything, personally. Yeah. I would at this point paraphrase Albert Einstein um, because he said, I don't know if it was a very famous quote where he said that um, the only truly original thought is a creative one. Mm. So creativity is absolutely, you know, it's at the foundation of any discipline. We were talking beforehand about how you can, you could teach any subject, you could teach maths or science. The best way to teach is really through, is through art in one way or another because art is creativity. Um, and I mean the, the other and the context of that question this might be your next question might be preemptive um, is what is happening at the moment in terms of arts and education and, and the narrative is one of an absolute assault on, on arts education and one of, um, of any, any kind of art practice being pulled away from GCSEs and away from 14, 15, 16 year olds and, um, and that's a tr it's a tragedy it, is. it definitely is a very big tragedy, and it wasn't my next question, but it was slightly later on. <laughs> oh, right. so, <laughs> it's all right. Does anyone want to come in here with a question? No. Okay, not quite yet. Thank you. Just took a bite, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it's a very easy question to answer, but my secondary school I went to, um, when I was in year ten, they they changed to an academy which meant they had more control over the curriculum. Um, so what they did was 
they scrapped lessons on Thursday afternoons, which is two hours of um, lesson time. And the year 10s and 11s were like let to go early, it was like revision time. And then year 7s, 8s and 9s um, got to do a recreational activity. But in order to get those two hours on the Thursday afternoon, they had to scrap Charles' lessons. So they scrapped music and drama. <laughs> And they changed it <coughs> so that instead of having a lesson of art, a lesson of drama, and a lesson of music every week, they had one hour and they would rotate every three weeks which lesson they had. I know they're head teacher personally, I want to go back to it and I want to pretend to stop doing that. <laughs> What's the best way to convince her? Art's back on the map. You could bring her to one of these and we'll tell her ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's difficult because. Uh, Everybody's beholden to someone or something. And so that head teacher has possibly got pressures, external pressures coming from other areas, that there's a, a bit of a big picture of sorts. I remember when my head teacher joined our school, and one of the, I remember very early having a conversation with her about the importance of, of, of drama and arts. And I said, I, I get it, I get that, like, maths in English and science, in terms of current educational practice and belief, our clusters like the, the meat and potatoes here, I get it. But you need a healthy diet. That's the thing. You need your greens, don't you really? And that's what the arts kind of do. They're, they're your greens, you know? They're the things that really keep you going and buzzing. You need That's the spice of the diet that you're going to have. And she kind of went, yeah, because you yeah. I was quite pleased with that. But, um, <laughs> uh, but I think it's, I don't think it's just one answer. I don't think it's just going in there. I think what you need to establish is, is a dialogue of sorts. And I do think that what James is saying is important. It's about maybe giving up your own time to and say, look, come to this with me. Read this. Look at this article. Read that. Can I come in and do some work with your kids? Do you, do you see where I'm coming yeah. from? I, I, I think it's, clearly something you've got to work at, I think, in terms of having this dialogue with, with the head teacher. But like I said, um, often sympathy has to be levelled at <coughs> senior leadership teams because they are under tremendous pressure to get results. And they're under tremendous pressure for, to pay staff, to ensure that staff are there, to ensure, ensure that the needs of kids are, are there. So it's just a, it's a delicate balance really. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So that, that would be perhaps my way of approaching it. Have that. Ex expect it to be an ongoing dialogue rather than just a, yes, I'll change it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. you know. yeah. Anything to add to what you were telling James? Not particularly. I think he's much more well placed than I am. Mm -hmm. I think, I think, sorry. I think also it's, you have to find out what the reason is for changing mm. that is. Because just because they're an academy, it doesn't mean that they just can just make their not going to have been a decision from one person. There will be a strategy plan in place, mm. say like within the next five years, these are you know, the outcomes we want from that change. Or what we're, ex or not even what we want, it's what yeah. we're expecting yeah, to get. Yeah, because they'll have parents yeah. saying, why have you scrapped these subjects? And they're going to have to actually <coughs> say, well, we're doing A, B, C, and D. So it is a dialogue to say, why have those changes been made? And, you know, and then potentially also seeing how, what percentage of the students would object to that. Can you get a petition to be signed, you know, because you look like an idiot if you go in and go, well, I think that yeah, yeah. there should be music and drama and art, and then the students go, well, we quite like the recreational time. Do you know what I mean? You need to see how much support there is for doing that. And it is, uh, yeah, I think it is about the, the needs of the, of the, of the students mm. as well, because, you know, there are different cultures in different schools, aren't they? If you're a, sport, if a school that's very much about sport, and, and you come from a sports background, then you're going to find it easy to work in a school like that, than you are if you're not from a kind of sporting background. So I think, you're, I think you're right. It's looking at, at the culture and looking at what kind of artistic endeavours the school could potentially develop. You know. has, it, has it become a sports academy? What academy has it become? Um, well, it was a technology college, and then when they became an academy, it literally went from like this big long name to a really great academy. <coughs> um, so they don't actually have a specialty anymore. So what, what are the recreational? Um, they have different things. So like there were some that were like arts based. Um, like from what I know 
there was eight composing one, but they only had eight people doing that out of all of two campuses, year seven, eight, nine. Um, they had some water sports ones, they had horse riding, they had an extra language. Um, so that's the argument, is would the kids go, well actually we prefer to do. Mm -hmm. You know, <coughs> it might be, they might think that that draws in students from that would have gone to other schools, because they'll go, oh, well, we get to do horse riding, what academy do you get to do horse riding at? So that's what they're asking but, for. But then, but then the, the other thing might be to consider that, you know, you've got all these different disciplines happening, like you said, the ones that you mentioned. And it might be that you say, well, cause can I just, you know, not me, you, uh, <laughs> or someone, can, we, can I come in and run a, a drama workshop yeah, yeah. and just kind of get a seat at the table, you know what I mean, and just start it from there, yeah. And Maybe there's no one to offer it, right? At the moment, there's no one to offer a drama club. Yeah. Yeah. That might be the way forward. Start with that, you know. Also, like, the benefit of drama and arts in the other subjects in the curriculum like I don't know that probably would have to be part of a dialogue about like how can the skills that you get in these things benefit science and mm -hmm. English and all the things where you have to work with other people just like where you have to learn to just exist yeah. with your peers and like learn about things it's transferable skills isn't it that you kind of have to give pre do, do they have drama and music at the schools anyway at all yeah so they do have, have a drama like really good facilities, they've got a dance studio with a spring floor and but, wearable. But have they got like drama, drama as a GCC or music as a GCC? So they have got staff already that, to te yeah. that are teach. Oh right, okay. So that's a, that's a different thing again. So it's not like the school's completely barren. It, it, there is some kind of arts input within the school. But you have um, to choose to do it. Yeah. yeah. So it's been sacrificed for the sake yeah. of this other. Yeah. And curriculum numbers might be going down because mm -hmm. the fact is they haven't got it in year 7, 8 and 9. They're going into to study a subject where they're going, mm -hmm. what's this all about? Where they haven't got the disciplines that they might have got in, say, geography or history and other option subjects. So maybe it is about you talking to the music and the drama departments and saying, look, I'd like to come in and run a workshop and talk. First, maybe talking to the head and maybe saying, you know, can I come in and do something just to help your numbers in, in those subjects? Yeah. Does that help?
kind of internationally famous artist yeah. that they probably at the beginning of the thing never heard of. Um, but it turns into this amazing thing. We've done some great creative projects over the past few years. And uh, yeah, so that was that, that's my answer to that question. Is that a, w a weekend thing or is it in the evening? It's, um, we usually um, we usually do Thursday evenings, six mm -hmm. to eight. Um, so yeah, I'm meeting them this Thursday for the first session this year. We only have a break through winter and then uh, it just runs concurrently then, it just keeps going more or less every week. We've, we, it's changed a lot since I took over. It used to be rigidly every Thursday, and then if there was some reason why it couldn't happen on a Thursday, it didn't happen. And now we do, I mean, shock horror, we actually do stuff on the weekend occasionally, <laughs> you know? Uh, <laughs> but it's pretty, pretty much up for grabs now. We just do, I let the group decide when they want to meet, and then we do that. That's a good way of working, isn't it? You've got that, that, own, that ownership. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, I mean, you know they're going to turn up. The more logged to turn up, they're not. Yeah. So that's yeah. when I took over the group. It was kind of like this amorphous group of twenty-five people who um, who would come to odd things occasionally. Mm -hmm. They're all there. The same group of twenty-five people, but um, you wouldn't see someone for two months. Uh, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so we just had to bit by bit. It's changed dramatically. No, it's a much more independent group. Um, so. Have you ever got sick being on that canal boat? Um, <laughs> almost once, actually. And I have very sturdy sea legs, uh, which was not uh, in my job description. Uh, yeah, it wasn't a prerequisite towards doing that job. But um, yeah, me and my colleague Flora, she's the creative one in the team. I'm there to think about stuff, apparently. And, um, <laughs> and we, we did a workshop. We did this thing. Uh, with screen printing. She's a printmaker. Um, she studied illustration at BCU. And uh, as part of, with screen printing, you have to clean the um, screens mm -hmm. very regularly with water. Mm -hmm. And we realised that we were kind of bending over and cleaning these screens for about five hours. And then when we got off the boat afterwards, we both felt absolutely mm -hmm. shocked. Because you look like that. Yeah, so the movement. Mm -hmm. That's a longer answer than you probably wanted. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was quite interested, to be honest, because I've never been great on boats. So, it's just... Yeah, they don't, it doesn't move that much. You can put on that boat sometimes. Sorry, I've got a question. So is that part of the education? Is that kind of obviously funded through the MPO? Um, and uh, no, actually. Or is it just... The, they just so, IYP has always had it another... So, we have a, a, like a tranche of money, a large amount of money, mm -hmm. to run the gallery each year. And that keeps everything going. The building going, the public programme. We have a learning budget for our public programme for research and that sort of thing. And many other things. Well, marketing and, and to pay our wages, mm -hmm. um, and then for, for IYP we we uh, fundraise through other through trusts and charitable foundations, um, and that's kept it going for the last ten years, mm -hmm. and the, well almost ten years. Um, we've had three three year projects on the canal boat, which is um, actually lent to us by Sandwell Council okay. for free. So we maintain their asset, mm -hmm. which is worth quite a lot of money, and costs an awful lot of money to maintain. Um, and, um, and they get to see what we do on it, which is always interesting. But yeah, I mean, we did a national project for the first three years. This is before I mm -hmm. joined ICOS. A regional project called Black Country Voyages, um, which is artistic residence. Mm -hmm. That was for the second three years. And then the current program is called The Loop in the Loop. It finishes in 2020. And we've been working with five to ten artists in residence each year. So loads of artists rather than one per year. Um, and it's been great thing. So the, 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 one of the core things for the youth programme is that they're working, producing work with those artists in residence. Mm -hmm. And um, it kind of depends on who the artist is and what they're doing at the time as to whether that's appropriate for the group or interesting. Um, so part of my job really is just like to have a group of young people, got an artist, there's other things, put everything together on a canal boat, see what happens. Mm -hmm. It's a great job. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Justin oh. Wigan is a good example. So we had this, feel free to cut me off. That was ominous. <laughs> <laughs> Justin Wigan. <laughs> he was, uh, actually, he's a sound artist, oddly. <laughs> but um, he's he he slightly. <laughs> <laughs> try try again. Yeah. What's his name? Justin Wigan. <laughs> <laughs> but look, Justin's crazy. He's moved down to Cornwall now. That's not why he's crazy. Um, he's a sound artist, and he, um, he decided that really interested in dreaming and how effectively you design a soundscape and play it to somebody as they sleep and see what happens and that's his arts practice which is mm -hmm. radical and um, we did this for people they trusted us enough to, to um, 
Playtime said the glass they slept on a boat called the Botel, Birmingham's only floating hotel, <laughs> as plug for yeah. Simon who runs the boat yeah. hotel. And, uh, and <laughs> we did this project and then, and then documented the entire thing with the youth programme and then made it into an exhibition. And we, in doing in try and exit interviews with the people, actually one member who's a member of the youth programme that did the experiment as well, um, which sounds horrific ethically, but it's fine. <laughs> Uh, trust me, it was fine. Uh, we realised that three of the four people that did that experiment um, had the same dream independently. Wow. Yeah. That's and he's just, he's just figuring this out now. This is part of ongoing research, which is actually uh, new scientific thought, and I'm sure a PhD will be written about it at some point. Um, but this is why arts education is important. Exactly. <laughs> so for everybody who's involved in this project, it's been all that I to say it's almost a life changing thing for them, you know. Because I mean it's just it's just bonkers. And just you know the way that they will think about their careers from that point onwards, till the age you're seventeen and you've spent hours and hours on a boat with this crazy artist. Um, producing something that's actually new and like a new feel. It's just that's kind of why we do what we do. What yeah. sort of um, participants do you have on that programme? Where do they come from? Are they? Um, they come to us. We okay. I occasionally go out to schools, um, and usually it works. You know, it works with 17, 18, 19 year olds. That's the core of our group. Um, so occasionally, yeah. But it's it, you know, I'm not targeting any particular area. Um, it would just be if you're age 16, 21, and you're interested in visual art. Have to be interested in visual art. I don't think you would love to join your um, No, if I knew about it before. <laughs> <laughs> um, then, yeah, I mean, there's no, it's not selective either. It's just mm -hmm. if you want to come along and get involved. What I don't do is if we had five people, why well, wouldn't put them all at once? Which completely disrupts. It's like a waiting list of sorts. Kind of, there is a moment, based on. And there hasn't been a massive one, but I just drop people in a, mm -hmm. in a week at a time. So if you know anybody who's, no, it's completely free, it's not selective. Um, it's pretty democratic. Um, I mean, it's as democratic as it can be. You know, they choose when they want to meet, mm -hmm. and then there's a certain amount that's uh, programmed with the learning team, mainly with me. A certain amount that's programmed pretty independently by the group, and then there's parts of the program are, are uh, designed by the learning team um, because we're in dialogue with artists in a way that the group can't be. Um, because there's, there's a lot, I mean, not that I want to get into theory or laws of practice or whatever this evening, but there's a lot of, um, I mean, peer leadership is so interesting. The last 10 years, there's certain methodologies we're working with mm -hmm. young people that they're kind of in vogue, and uh, a lot of it is just complete horseshit. <laughs> um, so we kind of have a more pragmatic way of working that's a bit more balanced, I think. You were going to ask a question? Um, yeah, I was just going to ask, do you guys ever work to create like live art in terms of exhibition? Is it performance or...? Yeah, but like, as in still an exhibit, but like art that comes to life as part of an exhibit. Is that something that you guys would ever be interested Depends in? Depends on what you mean. I mean, f yeah, probably. I mm -hmm. mean, um, the, th the thing with my job is that there's so many interesting possibilities working in a place like an icon. Part of my job is, um, is always coming back to the question, is it visual art? Mm -hmm. If it's not visual art, then why are we doing it? If we're, do if we're using poetry as a medium, for instance, how are we justifying that and how is that becoming visual art? Mm -hmm. If it isn't, then you know, that's why we are what we are. Um, I think the, oh, I don't know what else really. That's probably the main question. The other thing is that there's so many interesting possibilities um, that could ultimately run away with themselves and wouldn't be part of our program. Mm -hmm. You know, like any organisation, you have an ethos, we were talking about that before we, we started this evening. Um, you know, you have um, you have a way of working. Icon is a brand. Any gallery would be a brand. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what makes that project part of what we do and why we exist? Those are kind of the two things. That, but ultimately, we do all sorts of things. It's just that we we sometimes have to remind ourselves that we have our own program, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. what we're working towards. Cool, thank you. So. Frankie, you had a question, and then Hugh will come on to your ex job. So if you start thinking about that. I've been thinking for the last <laughs> 20 years. <laughs> Frankie, we'll do your question quickly. Not, uh, Have you no. forgotten it? No, I just don't. I, I forgot it. Oh, right. 
I was just working with kids, working with kids, seeing what they come up with. Um, I truly, honestly, constantly being inspired by what young people create in, a, in an environment. And, and so, like, um, like we've, I've been teaching Macbeth, for example, this, this, this art uh, or this term, and working with the English department. And this goes through again with what we were saying about this joined up thinking of sorts in terms of looking at how curriculums work. So, um, in terms of doing the school production last year, what I thought was we'll do a school production of a play that my students in English are going to be studying years 9, 10 and in 11. So you know, I know that I've got students now that can quote passages from the text and understand them, understand the motivations and the themes involved the characters and even think about how things should be produced. Um, but, um, so you know, I've been teaching Macbeth as a, as a text recently and I say to the students every year, I say, every year somebody or some students will say things that I've never thought of before. You know, so it's quite exciting and it's really, really exciting to be in an environment with young people where somebody has a spark of an idea with something, you know, and they kind of do something or say something that you just think, I've never, I've never thought of that before. So it becomes very much a sharing experience. So, so for me, that's the favourite part of my job is when I'm working with a group of students that I know we're all on the same page pretty much in terms of how we're gonna how we're gonna work and how we're gonna shape things. Um, that's that's what I what I love. Fantastic. And you do quite a lot outside your job. Yeah, I do. What's your favourite part of all that? Oh, it depends. I get bored. I've got the <laughs> tension span of a gnat. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, it's a good job I've got this here because I forget that as well. So <laughs> <laughs> But um, so it really does depend. So there have been times where I, so I was in a, a, a musical before Christmas at the old joint stop called The Stars That Remain, which is a brand new piece of writing. Um, last year at the Crescent, I was playing Fagin in, in, in Oliver. Um, so, you know, so it just it really does depend on where, where my brain is at. I'm thinking, oh, people will do this. But the, the main state at the moment has been involved in the band, and I really am enjoying it. Front in a band and doing doing singing and doing a, I've been doing a little bit of writing with a guy in London and you know pursuing other things and doing other things. So that's at the moment where my my focus is. If that makes sense. So I'm kind of part the acting on the back burner a little bit of sorts. But who knows? You know something comes along that piques my curiosity and interest. And I think okay, if I've got time and I can fit it in, I'll I'll consider doing it. So. Be the most challenging part. <laughs> Go on, James. <laughs> <laughs> He's dominated James. I'm just having a drink. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That might give you the impression that I have many different hats, which I have to put on metaphorical hats, that is, mm -hmm. rather than a um, Yeah, that's the tricky thing for me is that I basically have three jobs, three people's jobs. And I think if there were more money in the arts, there probably would be three of me. Um, there'd definitely be two of me, because you could easily have one person. Um, I think it's when you're working with, when there are students who in some way or form cannot connect with either the school or the curriculum and you can see that they're troubled or they're, they've got some kind of problem but you can also see that there's some kind of spark within them there and it's when you can't get that student or convince that student or get that student to work with you, and then they, they say, like, leave the school, and then you hear about them not getting to where they really should be. Does, does that make any sense? Yeah. You know, I think, to me, that's that's the worst part of my job. So when, it's, when, you, when you see kids that have really kind of crackled with energy in a drama lesson, or you hear about how great they are in football, or you hear how great they are in maths, or whatever it is, when but they can't connect with the curriculum as a whole, they can't connect with the school as a whole, for whatever the reasons are, and then they kind of leave, and you might see them again a couple of years later, and they're like, 
not doing what they really want to be doing with their life. You know, I think that's the that's the worst part of it, just in terms of being the the saddest part of my job. Yeah. Have you just found over your career a way to prevent that from happening so often, or do you have any sort of you know, like when you I mean, see when you see a student that's obviously got some other things going on, some challenges in yeah. their life, that you can then maybe intervene or you yeah, can you, help you, to nurture. You, you, you do, yeah. So you might, you know, you might take a bit more of a personal approach to that student. So you, you know, so in terms of like teaching technique, for example, um, we obviously differentiate with students. And in terms of behaviour, for example, you might speak to that student as you pass in the corridor and say, oh, well, the drama lesson are really good. That is, a, is technically a strategy because what you're planting is to see for them to hopefully think that they can be, oh, well, I, I did the right thing, I'm, I'm doing okay. And so that hopefully that, they'll bring that kind of positive thought or direction into their, into their work when they come into, into the lesson. But, yeah, I started doing youth work. I started as a youth worker in the screen about 20... Oh God, nearly 30 years ago, just for the math. So I started doing that one nearly 30 years ago, and somebody just simply said to me, you can't save everyone. And they weren't telling me that in terms of saying that I was trying to like fight against the world and go, come on kids, you know. But just kind of making me appreciate and understand that where you can step in and support, step in and support, where you can't, there might be other people that are far more qualified far better than you have been able to do that. So, you know, you've got to step back sometimes and let them step in and make those decisions and those judgments and work and work within that. Yeah. But yeah, you you know, I, I would say that it's trying to forge a relationship with that student is really, really important. Um, and but you also recognise as well that sometimes you know for, my, for n numerous students, and certainly the ones that end up being anything from excluded or, or just leaving us to go elsewhere, their problems outside of the classroom are far greater than what's going on inside the school. And it's trying to create mm -hmm. that kind of balance, but also kind of recognising them, supporting that, and, and working with that. So. Thank you. Have you had any situations as well, James, where you've um, needed to find a strategy to nurture one of your young people's uh, room and Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've had all sorts of challenges over the past two years. You'd be surprised how much work you can cram into two years. It's mm -hmm. really worrying. It's quite mm -hmm. scary. Um, yeah, I've had a few things. I mean, I've had um, I've had some some young people who kind of who've basically been chucked out and then are at risk of being homeless mm -hmm. and then are living in hostels and um, and we've supported them in, in the way that we can, you know, because we we. We know what kind of organisation we are, and we know what we can do for young people. Um, so it's the same, knowing the limitations and knowing the strengths of... Yeah, exactly, of knowing what your remit is, and knowing what is appropriate as well. Mm -hmm. And also working with other the right organisations in the city, mm -hmm. um, which could be charities like St Basil's, for instance, yeah. who you know know exactly what they're doing with young mm -hmm. people at risk. But it's just getting them in to work with you, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. 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 And also, I mean, there's a whole... We have a... Just to give you a, an insight... We, we have um, a pretty massive safeguarding policy, mm -hmm. as you can imagine, when you work with young people. And then s and so do organisations like St. Basil's or mm -hmm. charities of that sort. And uh, sometimes you'll find yourself in a dialogue about somebody, and you know who you're talking about, and so do the people at the charity, but you can't name that person or acknowledge mm -hmm. who they are, but they need to know that you're aware of certain things and vice versa. Um, so, I mean, it can be really confusing and um, I think, challenging. I think it's really interesting, like arts leaders, like, especially for me, probably for a lot of us, because we all come from an arts, doing arts a lot as students and young people, that it was the arts teachers that the ones that we were closest to and the arts leaders that was ones that we could confide, confide in. So I think it's just a really, um, it's just so valuable to have those sorts of leaders within your community as a young mm. person that you think, oh, they're sensitive in a way, or mm. they might understand, or, oh, they even, oh, they let me swear in class because it adds something to the drama or whatever it is. Like, Did you swear a lot to kids? <laughs> no, and I don't any, as an adult, you know. <laughs> but it was just, it, you were able to have these arts leaders 
who you could be close to. And I think I just think it's really valuable and really important mm-hmm. role to have within a young person's life. Mm-hmm. Frankie, you had a question. My question was about safe learning. <laughs> uh, uh, we answered it. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. yeah, is that yeah, the question yeah. you were going to ask earlier, or is, are you still no, part of that? No, that's the reverse. That's correct. Oh, right. It's like a sequel. <laughs> <laughs> Never know what I'm going to ask next. Has anyone got any questions at this point? Um, yes, hey. Yeah, so, I've worked with like, young people who are really bothered about drama, and those that are completely like, turned off by the idea of it. Um, so, like, in your experience, I'm sure maybe you come across that cross response, like different responses. What would be your response, knowing how beneficial drama and the arts can be? How would you respond to like their view on it? How would you work around that? It might be different in school because obviously we have to be a drama lesson, but. I do, but, but, some, but some kids will, will vote not to. Yeah, you know, don't yeah, trip so Don't trip So I, I remember having to deal with a student recently who, who was who occasionally was treated and really picked up. And um, she was she was not turned up to school on a particular on a particular day. And I and I, I said my spider I go to spider sense. My spider sense was tingling. You know what I mean? It's like going, I think this is the drama. I think it's the drama mm-hmm. thing because this comes up now and again. And it was simply because of the fact that she knew she had drama on that on that day, and that was a reason. I don't think it was the reason, but it was a reason why she wasn't turning up. So, the one of the pastoral members of the pastoral team, myself, this student, sat and we talked it through, and and she was fine. You know, I think it's giving her that kind of one-to-one discussion and dialogue, and actually saying to her, okay, so what's what what are you worried about? What's the problem? And I very much in my practice as a teacher champion the underdog very much so I understand that there are kids in the room that probably aren't that confident uh, but I kind of have a kind of it's all right don't worry about it kind of attitude chill you know you did, yeah. you know I'm quite a little bit like that but then you know if somebody does turn around and starts laughing at the kid inappropriately then they very much know that they're gonna have to deal with me on that and I'm gonna be protecting them and, and kind of like very much saying, look, that is out of order, stay behind the end of the lesson or discussing it in a little, little bit more detail. And so by creating a culture of that, a culture like you were saying where you're able to be a little bit more sensitive and be a little bit more relaxed, mm-hmm. hopefully we'll see over time that kids that, that tend to just naturally don't mind coming to a drama lesson and start to think, oh, you should have a laugh at this. Mm-hmm. It's all, you know, I'll say to kids, you know, name another lesson where you're allowed to shout as loud as you want to in a room. You know, so we're doing an exercise, and, just, and they're like, mm, okay. just shout, just shout. You know, when you see your little brother over the road, when you see your mate over in the playground, I know you can speak loud enough, just do yeah. it. You know, and they go, oh, you see him in the corridor. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just, and so you, what you'll start to do then is draw on personal experience as well. And you, you're kind of contemporising things a little bit more, and contextualising things a little bit more for the students that you've got in front of you. And that's really, really important, because then, it's not people only coming down to their level, and it's not even coming up to them, it's just meeting at the same level and trying to work on, on that kind of communication and dialogue at that point. Anything from you, James? Yeah, um, yeah, I've had many shining groups. I mean, you know, we, I don't do so much work with schools, that's one of my, my colleagues, Laura, it's her job to work with schools in the formal sense. Um, but occasionally I'll do tours, particularly if it's going to be a more challenging group and we front of house team also lead tours but um, you know they're earlier on in their career and sometimes it's more appropriate for me to take on 45 16 year olds who in the height of June last year have just been dragged around three of the galleries and hate the existence at that point <laughs> so in the, in the afternoon they end up in Icon and they're like oh you know they're carrying heavy bags they're just ready to you know they're just ready to go home and kind of finish with the whole thing but um, but for me i I uh, just have little techniques that I've kind of developed over the past couple of years. I mean, one thing is that, you know, by the way, when you all end up in jobs in, in arts organisations, it's unlikely that there'll be a kind of model of practice where somebody will say, right, read this and read this and read this, and then that's how you do your job for the next two years. Mm-hmm. Nobody's going to nobody's gonna do that. So you just have to figure it out yourself. Um, so, yeah, I've got little techniques, and s- sometimes even it's been kind of really art-aware uh, groups of young people that for, for one reason or another, you know, there's 20 of them, 
they're on a, a day trip as part of the youth program away from Wales or wherever, and um, they've only known each other for two days, and they won't, as a large group, speak in front of each other. Probably. Yeah, that's another issue. And yeah. yeah, like the whole point of my job is not for me to walk around icons and giving people this rote, delivered talk where I'm the only one speaking. That's the least interesting thing to me. You know, I need to get that group to talk to me and discuss the work, and that's the point of. You know, if we can do that in an hour, then I've succeeded. Um, sometimes those guys, you know, they're so they won't speak in front of their peers. So I'll just do simple things like break them up into small groups and you know take them around and split split the tours up and do that sort of thing. And spend a lot longer with them than an hour, even though I'm not required to. You know, I spent two hours with the college group the other day because they're curating their own exhibition and they had a million questions. Yeah. It was too interesting to not carry on doing the two hours, even though everybody in the office is thinking. He needs to do X, Y, Z, you know, for our opening this week or whatever. But yeah. So much of it is about trust and confidence, isn't it? Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, so if you've got a group of students and they don't want to say anything, like even yeah, tonight, like even tonight when you go, you know, we're doing a warm exercise to kind of get people to maybe ask questions and be engaged and want to say stuff. And we've all been there where we've had loads of questions that you want to ask in something. But because you don't feel perhaps comfortable, confident in the group that you're in, or you don't trust you and stuff, do you see where I'm coming yeah. from? Because you, we've got that natural carapace that we've got, and certainly when you get older, it gets more rigid. You know, so you think about five-year-olds, like I was saying about that example of shouting, you know, mm. a five-year-old will see their mates and just all go, all right, mate! Like, you know, total, inhibi you know, not inhibited at all, you know, that's really. <coughs> so I think trust, think, and if you're the practitioner, they're enabling them to trust you. That's the first thing. And then within that, I think, is then that confidence will grow, won't it? Because you go, oh, they're okay. They're fine. I can say this. I can do this. They'll allow it. And it's kind of working from there then. Well, you can if you've, if you've got a good, healthy dialogue with your boss. Yeah. So they understand the parameters and you've already established the fact that I've only got this class. And we're all adults, so hopefully in that, in that kind of teaching environment, you're going, I've got this class one every, once every three weeks. So your expectations are, you know, and measurements need to be very, very different to the expectations and measurements you might have with, say, English or maths. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the good thing, perhaps, is, is that you've got a curriculum, you've still got a, a start point and an end point of sorts, so, i.e., the academic year. Mm -hmm. So you might be thinking, I've only got them once every three weeks, but by this point, hopefully they'll have reached there, mm -hmm. and then you just adapt and change whatever it is that you're doing based on how they're getting on and whether they're getting... Th sometimes they'll exceed that. Your you know, absolutely, constantly. You've got to constantly rearrange your aims and change your objectives. You can't just... You know, was it another Einstein thing about insanity is repeating the same thing again and again and expecting the same results? Is that right? Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. you know you, and whilst, you know, I've got all my lesson plans and everything, you know, sorted at the zoo, you know, it's all there. Every time I change something slightly based on the students that I've got in front of me, I have to do that. You know, I have to do that. So. Yeah, that's the beauty of doing drama as well. As I'm actually thinking doing drama with PPC as well. And um, unlike English or maths, where you have a very, very specific, strict curriculum, you do have a lot more ability to be fluent in what you're teaching. And um, they've got the, I can't think of off my head, but the, um, like the three things they say to do, you've got children being destructive, it's you deflect, um, deal with it, or something else. It's distract. Yeah. Distract, yeah, I can't think of my head. And, and you have more ability to adapt to naughty children or people that are being difficult than you do if you're in a classroom situation or sitting at desk. You, 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 you can, but, but then I would go back to the fact of trying to think, be creative mm. thinkers in terms of all subjects. So, mm. that, you know, there are English teachers and math teachers who are, who are, who are for, for not, you know, phenomenal. And the reason, often the reason is because 
they're just very, very creative in their approach to their subject and how they teach it. You know, and so whilst you, you know, some people kind of you look at a curriculum go on kind of boxed in by it, mm. and some people kind of look at it as as like a challenge and go, so, okay, that's what I've got. Well, I'll see what I can do. You know, it's a bit like the big master chef and they give you the box and they go, that's all you got. Cool with that. You know, and some people be going, oh god, where do I start? And some people go, I'll do this. You know, it all very much depends on the kind of template that you are. I think as a as a person, yeah. So, but there, yeah, there's arguably a certain freedom, and I think because with drama, most people tend to not understand it, get it, or it, you know, it's like the cousin that they stick up in an attic sometimes, you know, and wheel out at Christmas. Um, because people, you know, what I mean, people kind of go, that's they do things with people. I kind of don't get it. So you kind of get left, left a little bit to your own devices. So a real simple one to go on to next. Um, we've spoken a little bit tonight about kind of the budget in our education going down. So what do you think could be that impact on society? Or oh, yeah. impact us? Well, so a nice simple one for you. <laughs> this is kind of the question that I saw the five times earlier on. Yeah. That um, you know, you almost don't know what you've gone to it's gone to something. Mm. And um, and I think that mm. for all the cuts and this assault that on, uh, on arts education at the minute, um, we'll probably feel that in five or ten years, at which time hopefully things will be moving back in the right direction anyway, I hope. Yeah. Um, but I, I mean, who knows really? I mean, politically at the moment we're, we're in a very interesting situation. That's a good word to use. <laughs> yeah. 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 It is, isn't it? And I mean, I, I sat down with, um, with a college group the other day and sort of um, Sort of said, what do you think about Brexit? <laughs> and they said, we're not allowed to talk about Brexit. They banned, they banned political uh, discourse. They didn't use that word uh, at school. Wow. And I was like, what? and the teacher was there, and I was like, what is going on? Like, they made names. That's ridiculous. Yeah, I was like, what? I was like, we're well, getting into fights because that would be a good thing. Right. You should be getting into fights. That's the whole reason Brexit happened in the first place, making people talk about it. And exactly. They didn't know what they were talking about, what they were talking about. Apart from what they, you know, we've they mentioned the big word it. already. But the analogy that I used was one of, um, so when I was studying, um, um, kind of around when I finished school, was just before the financial crash in 2008. And I was using that as an analogy, basically, because my generation were, in a sense, pretty much screwed over by, by the recession. There's so much less money in the arts directly after, which is like it's evidence in, mm -hmm. uh, just in the organisation that I work in now. Um, you know, and you can really see that impact. I mean, you can see the difference between uh, Lindsay, who's a head of learning, my boss, is five years older than me, and, um, and you know, she could see the difference in the number of jobs on offer when she finished her degree and, and what was on offer when finish mine um, and that will be the same case with Brexit so I, I was saying to these guys who um, are 18 years old now and couldn't vote in 2016 um, that you know if they when they get the opportunity to vote whether that's in a second referendum probably not or whether it's a general election that they need to exercise that right regardless of the fact that the political system might be horribly broken um, because you know, if you don't have a say, even if the whole political system is completely fucked, um, then you don't have an opinion. You know? The only way you're going to affect the change, really, is to, yeah. is to exercise mm -hmm. that right. I said to some kids, we talk about voting, because we do um, like internal voting, which is a thing called a city called Votes for School, um, where every week we talk as a choose group about a particular topic. And the one thing I said to them is just simply that, just please realise that there are people who died so that we could actually vote. <laughs> so that's when you ten year old. The effect was that. So, <laughs> but it's but it's true, isn't it? You know, people people died so you can so you can vote. Yeah. You know, well, so true. so so kind of, you know, put 
Get with it, please. Mm. You know, use it. You know, really use uh, it. Well, what was it, 2018 is the centenary of women's yeah. rights to vote as well, yeah. which is another great example of using young people, you know, people who are willing to um, starve themselves to death in order to gain the right to vote. I mean, that's a good thing. But, yeah. It's not all doom and gloom, though. I'll just clear my throat. Let's hope not. Anything else? I remember. I remember there was a time when um, my previous head, um, rightly and wrong and wrongly, I think that there was a sense of the blank checkbook in terms of being able to sign the different art, artistic endeavours that staff would want to do, and that doesn't really exist anymore. I suppose where it is good is that you thing, it, it allows you to sharpen your focus, and it goes back to the whole master chef thing. You look at what you've got and you go, right, I can, I'm going to work with that. I'm going to work from there. I'm going to work with that, I'm going to work from there and see where I can go with it in that direction. Um, I mean, it is, I do, th I think like you, I think it is pretty bleak, and I also do think that perhaps in five to ten years' time, people will start to realise just that little bit more. Uh, you know, the criticism I level at more, most, if not all, politicians is something that we're, I suppose, most of us are aware of, is just simply that they are, there's this sense of being very much self-serving and about personal legacy rather than actually really thinking about the needs of, you know, legacy in terms of personal rather than, you know, in terms of the people that they're supposed to be there to actually govern and serve and work with. Um, but, you know, maybe in five to ten years' time, it will shift and it will change. And people will suddenly go, oh my God, what have we done? We need to change this. We need to put more money into this. Um, so. Well, I certainly hope so. Um, before I start to wrap up, has anyone got any final questions for James or Sid? Um, or shall I introduce? Ask a question. Everybody asks you some questions. I have a questions. question for James. I, was just, yeah. I know it's not really your job, but I was wondering, obviously, in terms of, obviously, you say that the majority of your funding is, is government funding. Do you have corporate um, sponsors or, or relationships yeah, with that do. do your civic exhibitions? And yeah, um, yeah, so we've got a number of corporate partnerships. Um, so to give you an example, I mean, you know where iPhone is. We're surrounded by mm -hmm. bank offices um, mm -hmm. and Deutsche Bank. Um, has funded all sorts of things. We have an ongoing partnership with them, um, and they funded they funded a whole exhibition. Um, I think about five years ago now, um, and yeah, we we also get a lot of support in kind from other businesses. Um, so you know, we there's a um, there's a pepper marketing agency that we work with called Pelham Toms, who um, do a great deal of work for us. Um, there are lots of examples. I can't remember. Off the top of my head. Yeah, they'll be listed somewhere in the small print. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But presumably, I mean, that's the way, I mean, not so much schools, but, I mean, this is what I do, I'm in arts sponsorship marketing, and presumably moving forward, as the cuts, especially as the intended cuts, 50% cuts for Birmingham, goes yeah. forward. Well, but, yeah, more than that. Yeah, but, you know, Birmingham organisations are going to have to look more to kind of yeah. corporate relationships. And, and schools to, do, through, through yeah. you know, Academy Trusts, and then yeah. you think about the way that Academy Trusts are kind of, Generated, mm -hmm. they are for far more from a business business mm -hmm. perspective, um, and schools are free to try and build links yeah. if they can justify it and if it brings revenue in and you know in one increases results but also um, helps with the education and development of students mm -hmm. in school. So mm -hmm. now and the staff as well, you know, mm -hmm. to see people. Well, sorry, I wasn't really a question. Well, it was kind of a question, but <laughs> is that, I mean, I know it's not your role, but do you think that's potentially where the institution might end up going? Yeah, for sure. Actually? I mean, that's actually a model that um, there are lots of galleries in America that operate primarily from, yeah, from development funding. Well, there's no, I mean, you think that the government funding in the UK is bad. In America, it's like 100% yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, galleries have found other ways of, of doing mm -hmm. things out. I mean, the, the fortunate thing for ICON, and this is something you mentioned, is that um, you know, our, our local government money has been reduced to nothing now mm -hmm. over the next couple of years. Uh, but that's a fraction, it's still a significant amount of money, but it's a fraction of our overall funding, mm -hmm. which is central government and arts council and us being an MPO. But other galleries like New York Gallery Warsaw are um, 
50% were full of them, and the rest is match funded by the Arts Council. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, who knows what will happen to galleries like that? We're, we're actually doing okay. Mm -hmm. The other point, like a broader point about arts careers, is that if you look at, um, if you look at any professional career, um, you'll see that engineering and other things are at the top in terms of pay bracket, and um, arts has always been the lowest paid professional career that you can have. Um, and that just says more about like how we value art in society, but, you know, on top of the fact that it's being destroyed in schools. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, well, it's more doing than doing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Happy New Year. <laughs> yeah. um, any other comments from anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. So, I think we'll then we'll round up and say thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, there's a few things going on at ICON. Um, firstly, if, I mean, if you know anybody who's aged 16 to 21 and interested in visual art, then they could join our group. Um, and all you have to do, sorry, it is, it's not younger. Um, <laughs> all you have to do is go on our website and look under young people, uh, learning under young people, and then there's information, a bit of information about the group on there. Um, uh, yeah, and if anybody is interested, you've got questions. Yeah, is that the group that makes on about? Yeah, not every week, and certainly not this time of year, because it's freezing, we don't have any heating on the boat. Um, but yeah. yeah, we use it as a kind of, it's, um, it is, yeah, it's, uh, it's one of the only accessible boats in the city, if not actually the only at the moment. Where is it? Um, so we more around bring your place by Icon, um, at the moment it's in a kind of depot, a canal road depot just down at the canal. Um, but yeah, we can basically kind of take it anywhere. The canals are their own thing, they're quite difficult to navigate at times, um, literally. I mean, at the moment, they've closed the canal at Gaff Street for the, you know, they're putting the tram yeah. lines in. So we can't, I wanted to do this great thing where we go to the uh, university, where we go to the Barber Institute on the boats, and I've had to rewrite that whole program because the canal's closed. <laughs> but that's another aspect of my job, yeah. which is ridiculous. Also, managing skippers and crew and stuff like that. I mean, I never thought I could do that. <laughs> job. Um, but yeah, we're also, if any of you are interested in, you know, particularly if you've got customer service experience and an interest in visual art, then um, you could potentially look into getting the same job that I had three, four years ago, um, which is, um, I mentioned at the beginning, it's called information assistant, um, where you're kind of, it's a great training role. You get to do all sorts. Um, you get to do first aid and fire safety, and you're a key holder, and it's a position of some responsibility within the organisation. And it's an amazing kind of um, career boost. Um, the deadline for that, it, it runs every three months. So we have um, temporary six months contracts and a team of five, six or seven um, people doing that job. Um, so if you're interested in applying for something like that, it's, many of you are probably current students and therefore can't do a full time job. But um, the deadline this time is on Monday. Um, and then if, so if you want me to interview you in a few weeks time, I'm on the panel. Uh, then you can apply, um, and then if not, then you can wait another three months, or you can wait until the end of your degree. But it's just something that's there in city, and you know, it's basically like a graduate training program. Basically, it's a really great thing. I've got one thing to put aside very quickly. Yeah. My band have a gig on the fifteenth of March <laughs> at the Heron Hounds in uh, yeah. at the Heron Heron Hounds in uh, Kings Heath. We're called the Atlantic Players. Yeah. So graduates of age, um, we have a uh, well, I think so we're going to mention it the We have another um, artist Tuesday event about today. Uh, on February twenty sixth. Yeah, February twenty sixth, <laughs> which is uh, focusing on arts and technology. We also have creative ignition. Do you want to talk a bit more about that? So um, this is the third iteration of Creative Ignition, which sort of the original one kickstarted graduates and leashed um, as an organisation. Information is here. Um, it's a two-day mini festival, uh, free workshops, masterclasses, and talks. So we're going to have talks about developing creative CV and fundraising and marketing and branding yourself. Um, our artist talk. Uh, it's not us Tuesdays, it's going to be on a Thursday. Um, but it's Friday. On a Friday, I apologise. Uh, oh, that makes sense because it's March 8th. 
which is International Women's Day, so it's going to be arts and feminism talk. Panel, really interesting group of people. Great. Um, there's going to be a discount for um, the show that's happening in the evening. We get a we get a free foyer performance at the Hippodrome. And there's lots of stuff lots happening. Of discounts in the cafe. It's eleven. It's, it's eleven to six thirty. Yeah. Um, you'd have to come all day. But there's different things, and the program will be announced. If you know that uh, a lot of other people that would like to come, I've got a box full of loads of flyers, so you can just feel free to go and come and ask them. Uh, also, we have the prize, and um, the name I took out was Izzy. So, I'm glad you did. Please share about the upcoming talks and events that are happening with your friends. No, don't have to be. We've got a lot of theatre people that come to these things just because that's what our background is. But you know, other art space or you know, marketing even and other sort of design courses as well. We have some like a very open questions on that table. It's it's really useful. Um, if you could answer a couple of them, especially if you haven't been to any before, um, we really take the feedback uh, for future events. You've so. just taken everything. Say it's crying. <laughs> no, it's all right. Uh, get to know each other, grab some refreshments, fill in the evaluations, or if you don't want to talk to anyone, sit That's in the <laughs> You go sit by yourself in the corner until nine o'clock. Yeah, right. So, uh, thank you all very much for coming. Thank, thank you again to you Hugh and to James. Can I do one more quick point? Of course. Yeah, we're opening an office line exhibition. Can we talk about medicine? Yes. It's on New Street. Oh, yeah, it's an amazing Yeah, so it opens amazing. tomorrow night. Um, there's a performance at 6 o'clock? Uh, 6.15. You know more than me. <laughs> it's not like I work in the gallery or anything. Um, yeah, 6.15. Yeah, come on. It'll be interesting. It's emerging, emerging artists. That's an awkward term. But uh, emerging artists. So many of them have graduated from BCU, from Margaret Street. Um, some of them very recently. Um, and it's 20... Seven artists, so a group show. There's a lot to see there, and it's going to be. It will be packed tomorrow night. So if you actually, if you want to have a drink, then great. If you want to look at the work properly, then go next week. Mm -hmm. That's the medicine gallery. Table. Yeah, medicine bakery and gallery. Oh, it's a new. It's new. It's only been around for a On New Street. Yes. Do you know where? Sorry, you want to No, well, um, do you know where Wagamama is? Yeah. yeah. Opposite Wagamama is. Obviously. Oh, yeah, really <laughs> did. And it's like a really nice That's space if you want to just have a meeting or do some work. Yeah, Cronuts. Good cake. Yeah. <laughs> and don't need <laughs> any um, yeah, motivation yeah. to be cake. Great. So many people new street. So it's almost on the corner by. It's a really, and if, you, if you're putting on any events or you want a space, mm -hmm. it's an incredible space. Yeah, I mean, go and see it. It's a space, probably about as wide. It's pretty a big. Bit, yeah. A bit, maybe a bit it's wider than this room, and really deep. Um, and it's a really great gallery, but then they have tables and stuff set up for yeah. a coffee shop. Yeah. Any other bugs from anybody? <laughs> Sorry. That's fine. <laughs> Anyone else? Thank you very much.